Uh, let me just say a few words about Eduardo Barrera. I, I've known him for, uh, I think, 20 some years, approximately. I went to one of his sweat lodges in San Antonio with his brother and it actually changed my whole outlook on life in, in just a matter of hours. And I became an angel. You know, that's where I got my angel halo there. I, I subsequently lost it, you know, and it went away. But I noticed when Eduardo got on, it came back. So he, he can introduce himself for his many accomplishments as a professor at UTEP. And uh, I consider a spiritual leader in his community and uh, lots of great background as a critical scholar. So we've had a lot of fun at the Standing Conference of Management Organizational Inquiry, which lasted 25 years exactly. And then we disbanded. And Eduardo, this group here has mostly been to the uh, storytelling conference, what we call the Quantum Storytelling Conference. A little more background for you, Eduardo. The, uh, we're called in thinkment.com and we're interested in how, how to think things through and not just sense making. And let me just dive in a little bit and then I'll, I'll stop and let you dive in because I know you've covered this territory a lot, but with Firebrand, one of the things he's interested in is looking at Copernicus and Galileo, and along with some others. And, and he's interested in how this move from the senses, you know, our physical senses, to Galileo with the telescope. And the, the observations from the telescope were different than people's observations, this line of sight to different planets that they could see. And uh, the moon, for example, they thought the moon initially was flat. And then they discovered it's not flat, it's kind of roundy. And there was a way in which thinking took place with Galileo that was a little different than what took place with Copernicus. And uh, Copernicus also the delivery, the rhetorical style, if I could use that word, uh, was different in that he was more like this is a proposal that doesn't go against the church and all of that. Now, Galileo was a bit more out there, a bit more radical. He created a dialogue in which one of the characters was spouting the lines word for word from the then Pope. And this person was called a kind of a doubter that in some of the theories that Galileo was coming up with. Uh, not that we need to run the whole session on Galileo, but I think it's interesting that Plato had this idea of everything would be symmetrically out there in the cosmos. And Pythagoras had the idea that the earth moves and that was done very early. Now, it's important to know Galileo wasn't the first person to have a telescope, but he was the first person to put a theory of the cosmos around that telescope. And uh, that's that's why we go to Galileo. Now, because he was so radical, he was brought up on the Inquisition and he had to recant or lose an eye or something. He, the Inquisitions are kind of torturous. And so he recanted, but the last line that he said, I recant, but then under his breath, he says, the earth moves. Yeah, it still moves, yeah. Yeah, still moves. So take it over there, Eduardo. I've given you an introduction, but, but so we're interested in, in thinkment, which is a term of thinking things through it might take a generation or more, or it might take a shorter time, and then not just buying into our sensory. So that's what we're about. Eduardo, and welcome. And off and uh, dive in. Yeah, and I, and I was talking to Jerry that uh, we actually met uh, many years ago through the Peace and Dignity Journeys and all that. And uh, yeah, the the Inquisition not only um, was very hard, uh, be, even because around the same topics, they also executed Giordano Bruno. And even the one who actually built some of the foundation of modern science, uh, Willem of Ockham. Willem of Ockham, who was a Franciscan. And when Willem of Ockham, actually, we, or you might have heard that name around the Ockham Racer. And what the Occam Racer, it's today in, in many books of epistemology, philosophy of science, or, or methodology, uh, the Occam Racer is also known as the principle of parsimony. And the principle of parsimony, basically what it says is that you don't have to look for very unreasonable or highly complicated explanations 
that you should favor the most simple one to the explanation. For example, if uh, I go into a room and I'm dripping wet, there can be a thousand hypotheses about why I'm there. I can say, a UFO came by and showered me, et cetera, et cetera. There can be many explanations, but the principle of parsimony what says that we should favor the most simple one. And the church didn't, or, or the Inquisition didn't prosecute him because of that. The reason why William of Ockham was prosecuted was because he was he was a Franciscan. And he said that the church had too much gold, many luxuries, and, you know, all that philosophy, that charity that came from uh, Francis of Assisi. And, and, uh, and because he was a Franciscan, he was advocating that. So uh, the Pope actually ordered his execution. But then he would always have somebody that, that, that would protect him. Now, regarding the Pythagoras, it, it wasn't Pythagoras himself, the one who advocated, but it's somebody, I, I, I forget the exact name of that uh, Pythagorean philosopher and uh, astronomer that uh, Fight Event actually calls uh, a crazy Pythagorean philosopher, the one that came up with all those ideas way before Copernicus, Galileo, and uh, it, it's also interesting that a lot of the examples, they they always tend to use Copernicus and, and Galileo, not only Feyerabend, but also, for example, if you read uh, Thomas Kuhn in The Structure of Scientific Revolution, most of his examples have to do with astronomy and the heliocentric system versus the geocentric system. And the uh, so Thomas Kuhn, Feyerabend, but also, David Baum also used a lot of examples from, from astronomy. And so, in the case of Fire Band and uh, Thomas Kuhn, they would always use, for example, Kuhn, when explaining the paradigm shift. Uh, it would go from the um, Newtonian thermodynamics and then the, the theory of relativity and quantum physics. And uh, Fire Band does the same thing. But David Bohm also didn't just write about science, but then he would also write about the philosophy of science. And and, and he had very similar ideas to Fire Ben in uh, his book uh, that he wrote around uh, 1960, 1962, uh, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. Many of the ideas and uh, are, are very similar to Fire Ben. And in the case of Fire Ben, he knew he was very familiar with the work of David Bohm, because up until his trip to study in uh, in England, in Cambridge, with uh, Popper, and, and that was only because Wittgenstein had died, because he wanted to study under Wittgenstein, not under Popper. So Wittgenstein died, so he has to study with uh, with Popper. But in the in the case of Fire Event, all his previous career and research and studies have been about physics. And he knew perfectly, and he would even have some essays about uh, David Bohm and, 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 and quantum physics, quantum mechanics. So that's the background on the case of Fire Event. So he was very influenced in this case by, by, by David Bohm. And, and some of the ideas of bomb and and fire event particularly when it comes to when, when you're talking about the telescope and perception there there have always been actually the the first opposition the first two positions that we have that clash in terms of a a, a theory of knowledge between realism and or um, empiricism which was also closely linked to realism and rationalism and where in empiricism, the most important thing is what you actually perceive. That it's so. That's why empiricism that comes from the Greek empereia, which means experience. So it's what you experience through your senses. That's what empiricists would say. But the assumption that has always been criticized, and in the 19th century, you have the case of Nietzsche. Nietzsche is very critical of what he calls the immaculate perception. That is that. Reality, it's the way that we perceive it. Uh, and, 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 and that has been criticized even before, even before Nietzsche, we had Biko and others that were very critical of this uh, doctrine of immaculate perception. 
not to be confused with the, uh, uh, perhaps we're even, or a lot of people are more familiar with the Immaculate Reception, which was, uh, you know, the Bruce Steelers, uh, Terry Bracho throwing a pass and then being caught by Franco Harris or something. So the funny thing is that most people are familiar with the Immaculate Reception rather than the Immaculate Perception. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a way that we perceive it. And Nietzsche, in, uh, in his essay, there are two great quotes, Nietzsche, from his essay that is titled, Trap, Lies and Truth in the Extra Moral Sense. One of the quotes is uh, when he asks, and, and we also had David Bohm asking the same question, Fire of the same question about uh, what is the truth. And they pretty much are, were echoing what, uh, what Nietzsche said about when he asked, what is the truth? And the truth is a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms that have been used so much that we forget that they are ornamental. And, and so we could go and track down to Nietzsche what later on in the 20th century was going to be called the linguistic term, uh, particularly by philosophers like, uh, like Rorty. He was the one that wrote more extensively about the linguistic term. And then after the linguistic turn, the narrative turn. The narrative turn that we see, for example, in, the, in historiography with the, the work of Hayden White, when, where Hayden White says, well, if we're reading a historian, the historiography, for example, in his book, At the History, the uh, Historical Imagination of 19th Century uh, Europe, what he's trying to do there, Hayden White, is trying to find out exactly what are the narrative strategies of historians. So it's not a matter of who's telling the truth, but it's more about what is uh, the narrative strategy that the um, that the historian. So it's it's not a matter of somebody being right and somebody being wrong. Somebody telling the truth, a historian telling the truth, and somebody who is lying. It's not about truth and lie. So for Hayden White, it was more about the narrative strategies that they were using to select certain events, certain facts, and then link them together in a cause and effect links. And then what you have there is a plot, the plot of a story, the plot, the plot of a narrative. That that's what you have. Once that you select, okay, I'm going to include this events in my chronology, but a, a chronology is just a series of facts, or as some critic in, 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 in talking about film history used to say, one damn fact after another. That's chronology. But the ones that you link them of, okay, this event is causally linked to this other one, and then to this other one, that's when you have a plot, the plot of a story, the plot of a narrative. And so we see that narrative turn in the term in, in historiography or in history. So the, where the historian is more, the historian is a story, a storyteller, not a scientist trying to reflect, right, trying to write the truth. And the same thing we see around the same time with ethnography, with the so-called new ethnography. I mean, it has been 50 years in that, but we still call it a new ethnography that it's more subjective, that it's written on the first person and not the third person, like the classic ethnography, and where you insert yourself, the, the ethnographer, uh, insert himself in the story that is being told. So what we have there is the same way that the historian is just a storyteller. The same thing with an ethnographer. An ethnographer is not describing some kind of truth. An ethnographer is just telling stories. That's why, for example, Ban Man, Ban Man in um, Tales of the Field. So th those are the, the narrative or the, um, the narrative turn, uh, particularly in history and in ethnography. The other quote by, by Nietzsche is from a different essay, is when he said, there are no facts, only interpretation of facts. And, and that's something that we pretty much read. Can David Bohm talking about that and Fire Ben? They pretty much agreed with what Nietzsche Nietzsche had said uh, in the late 20th century. Uh, Paul Ricoeur used to talk about the three masters of suspicion, and the three masters of suspicion were Marx, 
Freud and Nietzsche. That is, Marx sus suspecting that th there was something more beyond the commodity form and the ideology, ideology in the sense of how society is being presented and described to everybody else to justify to justify certain relations of production. Freud was a master of suspicion because he suspected at the time that all the way that the child was presented during Victorian times as an innocent being. And so what Freud is suspecting that there's something more beyond that. And, and that's all that interplay of the uh, subconscious and uh, libidinal forces, etc. And then we also have that, that Nietzsche. Nietzsche is suspecting that there is no truth, that there are only interpretations. So I don't know if you want to uh, interject, David, or... Yeah, I'd like to just, just applaud you for the really good uh, philosophy background and lesson. I really appreciate it. What I'd like to do is come back to Galileo. Yeah. Because one of the people here, Sabina, her husband is David Trofimo. And in, in the book, refers to the formation of auxiliary hypotheses in, in this book. And I, I got a feeling that David Trofimo would really like to be here too. And in this, this pursuit of the auxiliary hypothesis, one of the things they, they couldn't figure out at Galileo's time was this prediction by, by Copernicus. I'm going to get the, the thing correct here. I think it was Mars and Venus, that they would have a certain level of illumination in the telescope and in sight. And people recorded on their own metrics the kind of illumination as, as the orbits happened. And this, this was data that was being collected even by sight, you know. And the other thing was, so there was this ratio that they had. Let me see if I can find the exact ratio that's listed in the Firebin book. Oh, yeah, it was uh, Copernican theory held that Mars and Venus would approach each other and recede each other or approach and recede from the Earth and, you know, and from the Sun. I guess the Sun would be more accurate. So Copernican revolution approach and recede from the Sun at a ratio of one to six for Mars and one to eight for Venus. And then they had their illumination ratios of one to 40 and one to 60, I believe it is. So Galileo didn't finish having an explanation of the variations between the telescopic data where these ratios were even less. I don't know if you want to touch that with a 10 foot pole or not, but I was just, well, I want to make the point that he didn't fully develop the theory and he only put together pieces of theory from, an, uh, I think the person you wanted to talk about was Ptolemy, P-O-T-E-L-M-Y, because it was the, the Copernicus used the data, I believe, from uh, Ptolemy's data and to come up with these ratios, statistics, you know. So, I mean, but Galileo didn't really, wasn't able to prove or disprove some of the things in Copernicus. You know what I'm saying? And so some auxiliary assumptions or auxiliary hypotheses were never tested in his time. That was my question. If you have, it doesn't matter if you know these ratios or not, but if you have some sense of that in the, how science proceeds. And we, we were talking last in our talk at the volcano, often by accident, that there's accidents that happened. And then later on, people will get a sense of it, but uh, not so much by the march of science, you know. Anyway, that was my question. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the thing is that we, a lot of the uh, greatest discoveries, you know, it's a, a war that's highly charged, have been done, and, and we talked about that once, that, uh, for example, when uh, that Einstein never went through all that protocol that he just dreamt, yeah, e equal mc square and and there's an essay about uh, bruno latour and bruno latour says that most of the most important discoveries like for example in the case of uh, pasteur madame curie and, and others were due to accidents in the laboratory not because they were following the the, the research protocol that, uh, that they were looking for something else something else and then they Ser by serendipity, what, what they what they discover, what they're famous of, and there 
There's a story um, that uh, neither Firebond nor Kuhn ever wrote about, and it has to do with astrology. Because before Kepler, Copernicus, uh, I mean, all what the all the Pythagoreans were also astrologers, and astronomy, as it came from uh, the Middle East, was also the the, the study of the stars was more astrological. There was no separation between astrology and astronomy. The same way that, for example, in the case of chemistry, chemistry came out of uh, alchemy. Even the word chemistry uh, comes from uh, alchemia, means uh, something like uh, black uh, black soil. And uh, but back in the uh, in the fifties, there was an astronomer that was trying to illustrate how. Astrology had no basis at all, no foundation, that everything was just made up. And and he tried to, well, if we get into a methodological uh, terminology uh, that we have a hypothesis and then the null hypothesis, and that's what, what we test. So methodologically, we never prove anything scientifically, all because all that we are testing is just the um, null hypothesis or the hypothesis of no difference. That's all we are doing. So we never prove anything scientifically. Scientifically, we are always accustomed to uh, hearing people talk about it has been scientifically proven. No, you cannot do that. From the the main approach, the the approach that is used today, the uh, the hegemonic methodology in philosophy of science. Is, a, is critical rationalism that comes from Karl Popper from the 1930s. And Karl Popper, who was the, the mentor of uh, Feyerabend, Feyerabend was reluctantly was a, uh, a student of uh, Popper. So in the 1950s, there's this astronomer, uh, let me see if I can remember his name, he was uh, Gokelan. And Gokelan tried to show that the links between what, would be predicted to astrology would be just random. It was just because of the people would suggest to themselves. So, so it was through the power of suggesting that people would believe it. So he, what he did was just got a really big sample of uh, birth data and where the planets and the luminaries as the sun and the moon are called. And he studied... He, he wanted to see if there was what was called, if there was data to support the Mars effect. The, what the Mars effect for astrologers and the, at the time and even today, what it says is that, that athletes, champions that have been very successful in their specialty, in their sport, that Mars would be in the horizon or as the astrologers call it, the, the ascendant. So that it will be on the on the east when when they were born. So he collects all the data, he gathers all the data, and then he founds out he finds out that uh, actually there was a statistically significant that that the Mars effect did occur in those type of athletes that were champions. So as a group of uh, Nobel Prize winners, and they published in a journal called the Humanist how it is not true and that uh, what's happening is that there's uh, probably some mistake in the statistical analysis of Gokelan etc so Gokelan gives all those all of them the uh, the data the the database and they see well no the the statistical analysis that uh, Gokelan performed is pretty much uh, uh, w- was right so then they say, well, no, what happened then was that they, that the sample was not random. So that there, there was probably a bias the first time. Now, and what happened after world, afterwards, what's called the uh, star baby that comes from that tale about uh, brother rabbit and the tar baby that somebody put a tar baby. And so that brother rabbit, is trying to talk to him and then was not answering, so starts pushing them and gets stuck with the tar. And it's called Star Baby because the more that those Nobel Prize winners try to 
say, no, there's something wrong in all the data that Gokelan is presenting. What happened is that even when they get a new sample as large or even larger than the original sample of Gokelan, what happens is that when they're processing all that, and, and one of them that was in charge of this notices that it's actually pointing out to a, a statistical significance of Mars on those on the birth chart of, of uh, many of those athletes. So what he does in that case is he starts to adulterate the sample, the database, and throwing out some of those cases. And so that's why it's called the star baby, because the more that they try to, I don't like to use, we, we shouldn't use the word prove or disprove. So all we can do with the null hypothesis is either reject it or fail to reject it. So when, when you took, when you take all those basic research method courses, that's all that we are doing. That is, we are never working with the research hypothesis. We're always working with the null hypothesis. And all we can do, we can we cannot accept the null hypothesis, much less can we accept the research hypothesis. All that we can do is if there's a statistical significance, then what we do is that we reject the null hypothesis. But we're never we're never accepting the research hypothesis. So all we do is reject or fail to reject. So that's why we never prove anything in science, because we're just working with the null hypothesis. Even Popper himself, Popper himself always say, okay, whatever you find out, it's just going to be provisional, provisional until we get other research projects that will give us uh, findings and results that are uh, that that contradict the previous one. So even Popper himself said that they were just provisional, that that we would that we had some use for the for the research hypothesis provisionally, provisionally. And uh, regarding there was uh, something else that I was going to mention about Nietzsche, and 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 it also had to do with what we uh, what I talked earlier about the uh, immaculate perception, the doctrine of immaculate perception, and. In, in that same essay of uh, lies and truth in the extramoral sense, Nietzsche says that, of course, reality is not the way that we perceive it. Because if we had the perceptual apparatus of a bird or a fly, the perception of reality would be completely different. So one of the big lessons from that star baby case was that even scientists are predisposed and that's what later on, after after the work of uh, of Kuhn, of uh, Feyerabend, and and I'm also going to David Baum in his uh, wholeness and let me see wholeness and the uh, and the uh, not implicit. He used another word, order, implicate order, the implicate order. Yes, thank you. Yes, and the implicate order. Uh, what what we have there just that they are just after all those works. Then there's something that comes out in the uh, in the 80s. It's called the study of science. That is that what you do is you study pretty much how scientists work sociologically. What happens at conferences? That is not just academic. Maybe the, the scholarly stuff is just a small percent. But the networking of hey, I'm gonna put this uh, reader together. So I need a chapter of you and then my other body, etc. Or uh, I have a special issue on on my journal, and so that what happens sociologically is very different from the way that we would expect science to work. You know, following all the steps of the protocol and everything like that. And uh, so, uh, and Bruno Latour, Bruno Latour uh, is part of those studies of studies of science. And some of the very traditional scientists tend to resent being studies, be, being the object of study, because as some other philosophers of scientists would say, that's a very, there's a lot of violence when we reduce human beings to being object of study. So that, that's very violent epistemologic, and, uh, but that was, has happened. Now, another 
aspect that we don't talk too much about is the influence of other forms of thought from outside, from outside the Western philosophy. Let's say starting from Auguste Comte, then the Circle of Vienna and the Logical Positivist, and then all that that was based primarily on induction is replaced by uh, the critical rationalism of Karl Popper. And then there will be all those that are critical of the um, methodological monism of Comte and Popper. And what's methodological monism? Thinking that there's a scientific method, that there's one and only scientific method, and that we are going to be using it in the social sciences, in the uh, natural sciences, and the humanities. But that was put into question by the end of the 19th century. So during the last 10 years, what we have is uh, we have people like uh, Bindelband. And, and Bindelband would say, well, there are two types of uh, research because what we have in the natural sciences is nomothetic. And we are looking for erklaren or explanation of one variable affecting another variable. And but in the in the human sciences that it was called the 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 little translation from the German would be in the the human science or the the actually the the direct translation would be the spiritual the, the sciences of the spirit and they're based more on verstehen verstehen or the uh, interpretive the interpretive understanding. That move saying. So that's when they to question that methodological monism that there's a single scientific method. And, and then even uh, Max Weber also joined that, also making that distinction between Erklaren and Verstehen. And then we have, uh, in, in the case of Bohm, in the case of uh, Kuhn, in the case of Feyerabend, that they were always following also. Eastern philosophy. David Baum was actually would have some dialogues with the Dalai Lama. And if we go back, uh, I know that David was working, for example, on and uh, or, or or you guys probably uh, read with David Edmund Husserl. And and the main disciple of Husserl was Heidegger, Martin Heidegger. And but after Husserl, the main influence of Heidegger was Kakuso. Kakuso was a Japanese philosopher who wrote the Book of Tea. So Heidegger concept of Dasein is actually based on that Zen, on Zen Buddhism. And so what we have in, in Baum, what we have in Kuhn, what we have in Fairaben, is that in a way they did not believe in the infallibility of a scientific method of, or, or the Western view. Of science. That's amazing. This is one of. I'm so glad I'm here to. Hear, oh, thank you for your answer and for the amplification of it.